Good morning, everybody. This is the RV Falcor on uh, our third expedition to the Great Barrier Reef this year. Uh, this expedition is the northern depths of the Great Barrier Reef, and we're currently on ROV Dive 396 in the Rodder Canyon. Uh, Rodder so named because we're near uh, Rodder Reef. It's about six kilometres due west of us uh, on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, my name is Dr. Robin Beeman. I'm from James Cook University in Cairns, Australia. And I'm joined in the control room by uh, Marty McNeil, who's um, a, a real veteran now of the, uh, of the Falcor. Uh, she's on board for 47 days. Um, we're on leg two of the expedition. I also have joining us uh, Vicky from uh, University of Queensland, uh, Valerie and Joan uh, from James Cook University too and also on uh, driving we've got J-Rod uh, assisted by Chris as well as John on the control so it's wonderful to be back out here on in the Coral Sea uh, we're inside the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and currently we're looking at a very large lump of wood well well um, chewed by uh, by worms and the like and uh, in fact we've been on the seafloor for about um, for a good half hour now uh, we've had a few technical problems just to sort out um, but now we're underway and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have lots of really interesting discoveries to make throughout the day So just to let you know, this is our um, so first dive of the of what's what we're calling leg two of this expedition. But we we've been mapping off uh, off Cape York, right? So this is a major a, a major focus of this expedition is that we're at the very far northern reaches of the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, uh, the big the big part of the Australian main, mainland here is called Cape York. So if you're having a look at, uh, if you're not familiar with the geography of Australia, if you have a look at uh, Australia and Google Earth, that great big long pointy bit on the northeastern side of Australia is called Cape York. And it's a real frontier area of, of Australia. Uh, it's very remote. Uh, there aren't many people that live up there. Uh, we're mainly talking uh, Aboriginal communities, uh, uh, cattle stations, a few service towns, uh, some mining camps. Uh, but most of, most of it is uh, completely um, natural vegetation and fairly isolated. It's not easy to get to. Similarly offshore, uh, in the deeper waters adjoining it, where we are now, uh, there aren't a lot of people that go up there. Very few tourist vessels uh, venture this far north. Uh, there is merchant vessel traffic that travels along through the, the inner route of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but certainly in this part, the offshore area, very few vessels come through here. Um, so we are in fact doing the first mapping, systematic mapping that's ever been done off the edge of Cape York. Now we've chosen Rodder Canyon because it is one of these shelf connected canyons. Uh, there is a really distinct ancient river channel that, uh, that connects to the head of this canyon. And we guessed that it would likely have uh, material from the shallow shelf out into these deeper waters. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. There's a lot of wood organic material on the seafloor. So we've got a uh, we've got coconuts in front of us and of course a uh, very large lump of wood as well. Uh, unfortunately we've also seen plastic bags so uh, we've picked up one or two already but if you think about what this means is organic material uh, uh, that's drifting down into the depths here it's obviously providing a lot of food for lots of animals this is the first time I've seen these white squat lobsters before, Marty. Yeah. Have, you, have you noticed this before? No. So I've got Marty McNeil next to us. 
and for the nautilus lovers amongst us all and there's there's a bunch here in the control room when we first sat down on the seafloor here in the axis of this canyon there was a nautilus shell right in front of us so uh we we may get to see uh hopefully a, a live one maybe uh later in the voyage we're far too deep for them for the living nautilus now but this was a a, a dead shell just sitting on the seafloor so we're really interested in some of this organic material that, that we're seeing down here. We're, so far we've uh, seen uh, mangrove propagules from the uh, brown mangrove. I, I'm very familiar with these because they, where I live in Cairns, you get a lot of uh, mangroves. Uh, we've got something moving across the sea for leaving a trail here. Can we have a look at that, J-Rod? A coconut that's left a trail. How about that? Yeah, I was thinking it might have been an urchin. There's been yeah, some... I wondered that at first too when we saw that trail. Yeah, some big urchins around here because they leave a, a classic trail on the seafloor. But it looks like whatever the currents are down here have pushed the uh, this coconut along left a trail behind it. And we've got some um, we've got some familiar familiar faces, uh, people joining us on on YouTube and Facebook. So uh, welcome aboard, everyone. It's nice to be speaking to you from the Falcor. Coconuts, everywhere. lobsters. Is that an octopus? Okay, let's have a let's have a look. National Octopus Day yesterday. Yeah, it was international, international, international octopus, octopus Day. Day. Yeah, it looks looks like an octopus. Yeah, definitely. We'll just see if we can um, just slowly get down there a bit closer to us, uh, to the octopus. There we go. Lovely octopus, and it looks like it's uh, it's got something underneath it. Maybe a bit of vegetation. There's plenty around. See all this. Um, this stuff, Marty. Yeah, what's he sitting on? Some kind of weed. Yeah. And there's all those tiny little sea pigs. Ah, uh, yeah. About. Yeah. They're okay. So if you have a look around the the edges of the octopus, you'll see these tiny little sea cucumbers. These are sea pigs. We don't know if this is their maximum size, but if you if you Google sea pig. And have a look at uh, pictures. These are like many versions of them. They're quite small. They're only a couple of centimeters across at the most. But there are a lot on the ground here. Clutches there. Yeah. Quite well, protective of it, whatever it is. Yeah. So the sea pigs were something that was new to us. We've not seen those before. Yeah, we're just going to, uh, yeah, a little boop, just see what happens. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, it's a no hurry to go. Uh, 
I mean, we know these octopus will lay their eggs uh, on vegetation uh, under rocks and things like that. It could be that there may even be eggs here. Um, so perhaps it's, it's better not to, to, uh, to be curious enough to come and touch us. Uh, we've seen that with some of the squid um, in the water column. They'll actually hang around and, uh, and, and they're quite tactile. They'll want to reach out and feel what's what's around them. Um, anyway, this one, uh, this octopus doesn't want to leave here in a hurry. So oh, we'll, um, there we go. It's just slowly move moving now. Missing Joe a tentacle. Wright? He's missing a tentacle. Yeah. Can you just zoom right quickly to have a look at what it was sitting on? See if there was anything unusual about that. No, it just looks like a bit of wood. I'm not sure what the white things are though. Yeah, unusual. Okay, if we can just have a look, go back to the octopus. Yeah. yeah. Something's had a chew of it. Don't you love the way they move? Yeah. <laughs> it's really going intent on going for a walk today. I mean, these guys are so graceful, they can move so quickly when they want to. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's just going for a gentle stroll at the moment. So just talking about the vegetation here, which seems to be blanketing the seafloor here, or, or big clusters of it. Uh, over on the right, it looks like um, some brown algae can only have grown in the in the shallow waters. Unfortunately, we're also seeing a fair bit of plastic. It's lightly advected off the off the shelf and into the canyon. I mean, we're down at. Um, 1763 meters so pretty deep but we're only six kilometers away from the shelf edge itself got bed forms here marty yeah yeah that's interesting so even at these depths you're getting current flow near seabed current flow strong enough to create bed forms these are these ripples we're seeing Um, start panning around to see if there's any other invertebrates around in this soft sediment that might be of interest to Jeremy. Um, little things that are sticking out of the sediment and then we'll just spend a short time having a look there and then we'll head towards the bottom of the hill. Please. And a shout out to Diane, my wife, who's watching from Cairns. G'day Di, everything's good here on board. Hope everything's fine at home. <laughs> Our plants are being watered. Hope my plants are being watered. That was the only instructions I left at home was water the plants. See you. Yeah, look at the uh, look reflection in the, the eyes. Yeah. So when we scuba dive at night and you, you're shining your torch around uh, the reef, most of the eyes looking back at you are these shrimp eyes, you know. Mm. Actually, when you see green eyes, it's, it's not good. That's a shark. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the eyes you see are the shrimps, right? So, you know, they often, they, they typically come out at night time, but, you know, it's quite common to see, you know, hundreds of these little shiny eyes staring back at you in the in the torch beam 
in the uh, flashlight beam. And Ben is watching, my son from ashore. Good morning, Ben. And we've um, we joined on. We've, we do have quite a large group of principal investigators from ashore. Uh, we've been joined by uh, John and William from CSIRO. Uh, we have uh, some also some familiar names. Uh, ben Frable from uh, Scripps Institute Oceanography joining uh, and watching, and also Kai T from University of Sydney. You can join where possible. So we welcome all of our uh, our fish army uh, to help us identify these uh, these fish. Uh, of course, we're down in the the depths at 1,700 meters. It's very cold, 2.5 degrees Celsius here. Uh, we'll have other opportunities to get into the shallower waters uh, for dives throughout the expedition, but for today we're going to be staying uh, deep deep and cold and dark. Big shadows yeah. coming up here. We're just going to have a closer look at the sediment here. Yeah, so lots of organic material. We've seen uh, mangrove sticks, coconuts, sargassum weed, uh, unfortunately plastic bags as well. Uh, we're trying to pick them up as we go, those plastic bags as we go along. Uh, so yeah, lots of organic material can only have come from shallow shelf waters, have got waterlogged and then fallen down into these depths. Scanning our eyes across this soft sediment, keeping our eye out for any um, invertebrates that will be of interest to our collaborators on shore that we're working with. Um, so we're flying quite close to the seafloor and pointing our camera downwards uh, to look at the sediment as we make our way towards the sort of first waypoint for where we'll transit up the steep cliff for our dive today. So while we're on our way to that waypoint, we'll just um, look downwards at the sand and um, try and zoom in on that a bit so that we can keep our eye out for anything that catches our eye that's sticking up out of the sand. Yeah, like uh, you know these carnivorous sponges that Merrick Eakins is interested in. Merrick's from the from Queensland Museum and uh, has a real interest in, in carnivorous sponges. So we're certainly at the depth zone that he, he's got an, an interest in. Uh, but what we're seeing is mainly very muddy. Uh, but if you have a look, there are these little sea pigs all over the seafloor. Now they're not very big, probably around about the size of your thumbnail. They look like little caterpillars. Uh, but they're definitely sea cucumbers. And they're obviously making good use of all this organic material that's raining down from above. Uh, bits of wood, um, algae, uh, well, even, even coconuts. So uh, the seafloor is blanketed with uh, this organic material. Sort of, it just raises questions of how much of this material is ending up on this uh, down here. Um, we did have, we did have clues that this was the case in our earlier expedition down the Ribbon, Can uh, Ribbon Reef Canyons. We did see uh, bits of wood there, but not a lot. Um, here, it's very, very prominent.
but of course it's very muddy too. Um, when we've we've taken a couple of push calls already, it's quite a slimy mud. So if you picked it up in your hand, and you could squish it between your fingers very easily. Uh, it would feel quite cold. It's 2.5 degrees Celsius down here. Uh, we're in um, Antarctic intermediate water. This is a cold water mass which uh, is derived from south down in the Southern Ocean, and it's it flows northward as part of this great uh, circulation of deep colder waters that uh, spread around the globe. And uh, down here, uh, if you were to pick this sand, this mud up, it would feel almost as cold as ice cream, and you could easily squish it between your fingers. But in amongst it all, you might see these little white flecks. Uh, these are scaphopods. Uh, scaphopods are a, uh, a pelagic swimming mollusk, gastropods. Uh, they live higher up in the water column. But when they die, they, they're little skeletons, little white skeletons. Um, they drift down onto the seafloor. And so you can just see these little white flecks in amongst them all. But uh, these are really pelagic swimming animals. When they die, they just end up on the seafloor. Well, there's a lot of these sea pigs, isn't there, Marty? They're, yeah. They're everywhere. It's my new new learning for the day, <laughs> sea pig. Yeah, I mean, we do see, oh, we've seen a lot of sea cucumbers on, on other voyages, but uh, we, we've not really noticed these little sea pigs before. First time I've noticed mm. them. Oh, yeah. On the way down this morning, we went past one of the, those large uh, purple swimming sea cucumbers, you know, the ones that are maybe 10 centimetres or so longer. Uh, but yeah, really the seafloor is blanketed with these, these sea pigs. So at the moment we're positioned in what we call the canyon axis. So it's, if you imagine the canyon being shaped like a V-shaped valley and we're on the valley floor which is where all this um, sediment and debris collects on the, in the axis of the canyon and that's what we wanted to come and have a look at. Um, for the most part of the dive today, we'll be following a transect up the steep side wall of the canyon. So it'll be quite a steep slope um, and we'll be facing the canyon wall. We hope to see a few hard rock outcrops that will be of interest to us geologically, but those are also the foundations of some of the habitats that um, other organisms can colonise on those hard, hard substrates. So we just wanted to know, make sure that we get a good picture of understanding what's happening on the floor of the canyon in the axis here. Um, we're certainly interested from a geological perspective and sedimentology, but of course um, this is all habitat. so. We've got many collaborators that we work with, and we are obviously genuinely interested in the biota and the habitat as well, um, just uh, out of our scientific curiosity. Um, we, Rob and I both scuba dive, so we're all, always interested to know what's living around the place. Um, yeah, even on the soft, muddy areas, I find them quite interesting too. Yeah. I find, you know, quite enjoy looking at coral reefs, but also like drifting over the lagoon, you know, the mm. sandy lagoon, just seeing what's just, yeah. on the on the sand. Jaron, can you put the laser beams on, please? Lasers on in the lower center. So these are 10 centimeters across, so we can get a sense of the scale here. Okay, shall we start? Yeah, head towards. Jerrod, can we start heading towards our first waypoint, please? Sure. 
and we can see in our forward facing sonar that there's definitely some rocks ahead of us so, or something hard ahead of us. Yes. So we're going to slowly make our way to the uh, the first waypoint of this transect. It's about a kilometre long. Uh, we should be diving for quite a few hours now. The idea is to start around about this 1700 metres and work our way up to a depth of around 1300 metres, so about a 400 metre vertical rise over the uh, length of the transect, which is about, about a kilometre long. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier, we, uh, as soon as we touched down before, we came across a nautilus shell. Um, so in these depths, they, they do not live this deep down. We have a pretty clear idea that the, uh, the, during the daytime, there are in, they are in deeper waters between, say, 500 to 800 metres depth. So this is too deep for them to live. The, uh, the shells, though, end up on the seafloor. And... Um, Earlier, when we first arrived here, there was quite an eroded uh, nautilus shell right in front of us. So, uh, nautilus uh, clearly existing along the uh, on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef. So quite a distinct mound in front of us, possibly halosaur, some kind of eel over on the right. So when we see these sort of isolated lumps of sediment sitting out on the seafloor like this, it's usually because there's been some sort of collapse. So this looks to me like uh, landslide debris, uh, not perhaps not a large landslide, but just simply a piece of the the sidewall has collapsed, and these blocks just come drifting down. Oh, a bit of rubbish there, yeah, mixed in amongst. Oh, it looks like mangrove mangrove seeds so this is looks like a little sea cucumber drifting along yep pretty small about well probably less than 10 centimeters very translucent so you can actually see the the uh, it, its intestines it's uh, the tube inside but it's using its tentacles like um, like frill tentacles to to swim through the water column Yeah, John Pognoski from CSIRO, he's one of our principal investigators, confirmed it's a halosaur. So it's great to have, have you join us here, John. Uh, we don't have any ichthyologists or fish experts on board, so uh, we're relying on our experts ashore to help us identify the fish. Yeah, do you see this burrow in front of us? This would be a giant isopod burrow. Uh, we've seen lots of them throughout the, the expedition. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more domed -like than this, but they have that they're quite large, good 10 centimeters across, 
and uh, on the a few um, a few ROV dives ago, a few days ago, we we were seeing getting a really good look at these giant isopods, uh, Bethy, Bethy no, uh, Bethynomus, um, sort of large, about the size of your forearm, kind of pink in colour, very strange looking animal. Don't know. Um, we just, yeah. Let's touch it. it. It could be just a bit of vegetation. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we've seen quite a lot of different types of vegetation: large logs, coconuts, uh, mangrove, uh, mangrove seeds. Um, this could just be another mangrove seed uh, of some kind. So about six centimeters across. Uh, looks like it's got a little gooseneck barnacle attached to it. But yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's a seed pod of some kind. Likely drifted in from, from the, uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef shelf, which is only about six kilometers away from where we are now. Yeah, if you can just tilt it around, j right so we can have a closer look. Yeah, definitely a seed pot of some kind. Uh, yeah, I can't recognize it. I mean, when you're, um, there's something I like doing is, um, is beach combing. Could be, could be a small coconut. It's got that kind of coconut shape about it. Yeah, it's pretty small though. Lots of things attached to it. Look like little polychaete tubes. There was a gooseneck barnacle before. Yeah, I'm thinking it's probably just a small, um, small coconut there, J-Rod. Okay. Yeah, plenty of animals are making well use of the that organic material. You could see uh, things burrowing into the side of it. No, it's definitely not a shark and coon. Ah, Nautilus, right in front of us. Yeah, let's just have a closer look at that. Thanks, J-Rod. So we've already seen one this morning. It was quite eroded. We've got another one directly in front of us. It's got a lot, it's much clearer. Uh, you know, it's got that lovely tiger stripe. Yeah, this looks quite intact. I think we can actually, yeah. I think we've got, we've got a permit to collect so I think we should I think we should collect this one. Yeah. Yes, this one looks in pretty good shape. In fact, we've seen two already this morning. That's interesting. Uh, we're not saying they're hugely common animals, but they are, they have a, a population um, scattered right across the Coral Sea. Uh, we discovered this from when we had our earlier expedition visioning the Coral Sea Marine Park at Osprey Reef. I think we counted up to 18 living ones. Most dives we saw either living Nautilus or we saw their dead shells. So this one's in pretty good condition. Uh, they're fairly fragile around the, the open operculum. So we'll have to be careful how we pick it up. But you can see there's uh, little polychaete uh, tubes on the side. So this one's been sitting here for some time.
Uh, one of the small bio boxes. Uh, put in A, please. Now, if any of you were watching previously when we had Jeremy Horowitz on board, uh, he he saw a small, delicate black coral on the seafloor. Uh, it looked like it was just sitting in sand. When he picked it up, it was actually attached to a to a Nautilus shell, which was pretty spectacular when it was pulled up out of the um, out of the the surrounding mud. You know, to see that appear. Thanks, J Rod. So bio box A. <laughs> you guys got a bit of a competition going, have you, with Nautilus? Yeah, Joe Rod's saying Nautilus can't, the ship Nautilus can't pick up a Nautilus shell, but anyway, here we are. All right, so heading over to our, uh, I guess the start of our transect as we planned it last night. Uh, so in the last few days, the uh, the Falcor uh, picked myself uh, Valerie and Joan up from Cairns and we've headed north. Uh, we've been mapping fairly solidly now for two days uh, on this, this section of Cape York. It's offshore of Princess Charlotte Bay, which is a very, very prominent broad bay uh, due west of us. Uh, when you're heading up into Cape York, everyone knows about Princess Charlotte Bay. So we're in that area of the, the GBR margin just uh, offshore of Princess Charlotte Bay. And uh, we've been mapping uh, for uh, through the night and daytime in the sort of shallower part of the, the upper slope. And I have to say, it's probably the most interesting, most complex part of the Great Barrier Reef margin that I have ever seen. And I've been mapping these waters for decades. Very, very spectacular uh, canyons, very deep, very steep. Uh, we will try and get some insets up for you to have a look at uh, through the dive uh, when John comes back from his uh, from his lunch, and just to show you how spectacular the topography is around here. Just wait for Jeremy to get that. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, Thank you. Joe Rod, can you just come over to the right a little bit? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Cody's in charge now. Just had a team handover. It's lunchtime on board. Can you just have a bit of a look at the... This it could be an anthozoan sitting here on the... out of the seafloor. So we've now got Chris and Cody on the controls. Uh, I've only got got a smaller ROV team on board, the Falcor this time, uh, J-Rod, Cody and Chris. Um, so we have to give each other plenty of opportunities to have breaks because of the you know, concentration required to, to run the, the ROV. Oh, it looks a bit like a C pen to me. Whoa. Yep, a C pen.
can move on. Yeah, move on, thanks. So we're just having a discussion here. Uh, we're collecting for our principal investigators ashore, Jeremy Horowitz, Merrick, uh, Tom Bridge, uh, and also for the Smithsonian um, uh, Institute over in the US for a big genome project. We're gonna hear a bit more about that through uh, through this throughout this expedition, but it's, it's quite an interesting project looking at uh, trying to do full DNA analysis, getting full genome sequences for uh, for some of these invertebrates we're collecting, including the symbionts within them. So if you think of symbionts, these are these are uh, algae or, or other marine life that use or, or inhabit uh, an animal. And corals or shallow corals are a good example of that where they have algae symbiotic algae within the the flesh of the coral uh, the coral derives maybe up to 50 percent or more of its energy from the uh, zooxanthellate uh, algae living within their flesh so there's a good example of the, of the symbiont so we want to do that in the deep sea and this smithsonian um, project that we're contributing to aims to collect animals and do full DNA analysis on the, the larger animal and the symbiont. And to do that, we've brought on some liquid nitrogen on board. So we want to flash freeze these animals when they come on board. So we'll be doing, we'll be uh, collecting some animals for the project through this dive and, uh, and future dives as well. little dark jellies <clears throat> we can we can fairly consistently seen those at this depth on other dives yeah we've yeah, seen a few of them drifting past yeah. yeah but that's not our um, not our sampling target today it's, um, no activity for another time another time yeah that's right so we do have Dougal Lindsay joining us for some other dives we'll have dedic another dedicated uh, mid-water dive with Dougal joining in from Japan. Uh, we do enjoy those dives, but we have to plan them quite differently to these sort of seafloor, benthic, community type dives. Now the halosaur drifting past. On the red thing. Can we take a close look at the red thing? In front of the fish. <laughs> it's like the fish is still there. <laughs> a, a bit of a zoom in on the on the fish, please, Cuddy. There's a pointer here. Can you point to it? You mean? I think we saw something red around this direction. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. You guys can fly. Thank you. So there's quite a lot of debris, uh, organic debris on the seafloor. Uh, we're just focusing on this this red thing here. Now, this just looks like a bit of algae, a bit of uh, red algae that probably have it's grown in the. <coughs> yeah, it look, just looks like algae to me, and this is it's broken off and it's now just sitting on the seafloor. Yeah, we can have, yep. we can touch it, but also have a look around around the outside. There's there's little sea pigs are everywhere. <clears throat> Looks like algae to me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all good, all good. No. Now we're okay. We're going to continue moving continue on. Moving forward. We've got uh, we've got Jeremy Horowitz watching from ashore. He's in Townsville. Was unfortunately wasn't able to join us out here, but welcome aboard, Jeremy. Um, we're using Slack to communicate in real time with our uh, with our other collaborators. So we're we're watching the YouTube, Facebook feeds, and also uh, getting Slack messages as well. So um, we're, we're trying to keep on top of everyone's requests that are coming in.
Lots of sea pigs here, Marty. Mm. So these little mm. little dots. Yep. Once you get your eye in, they really stand out, don't they? Yeah. There's another coconut we're going over. Wow, there's there's sea pigs everywhere. Yeah, it's bright, isn't it? Well, this is sargassum uh, attached to it, but the the red, I don't know. Anyway, we'll continue. It's very bright, forward. yeah. So the sargassum is can only grow in the shallower waters. Uh, very common on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, typically, is is blooming in summertime as the waters warm up. In winter time, the cooler waters, they tends to die back. Uh, but sargassum is, is very common in shallower waters. Uh, and that's obviously drifted out uh, through that uh, reef passage, the inter-reef passage, about six kilometers west of where we are now. And is, uh, is waterlogged and now just sitting on the seafloor. Debris blocks. We've seen a few of these little. Those little mud lumps. Yeah, mud lumps. All right. Okay. I'm just going to have some lunch, and I'm handing over to Marty. Good afternoon, everyone. It is just afternoon here. <laughs> My name's Marty McNeil and I'm one of the scientists uh, on board RV Falcor for this expedition. I'm a marine geoscientist from Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. And we're just going to make our way... Oh, hello. Something sticking out there. We're making our way across the floor of this canyon. Um, our target is to hit the side wall, well not literally hit the side wall <laughs> of the canyon, that would be bad, we don't want to do that. And then we'll have what we think will be quite a steep climb up the slope. Um, so we're scanning the sea floor for any other interesting invertebrates and targets that are that might that we think might be of interest for our collaborators that are on shore that aren't with us on board the vessel at the moment so we're trying to be eyes and ears for a number of different people at the moment that have got different projects going on in these deep cold waters we're interested in the sponges glass sponges carnivorous sponges um, for the Queensland Museum and we collected some on the last expedition and each one, every one that we collected turned out to be a new um, a new species um, undescribed I should say undescribed species and nice little brutal star looks like he's lost half an arm as well yeah. As we move across this soft sediment, we can see bed forms in the sediment. So the bed forms are those regular ripple-like um, formations, and that's they're formed by flowing water. So that tells us that there's some current that gets down here. And then there's also these little pyramid shapes. So they're not bed forms. That's bioturbation. So those little pyramids are made by some type of infaunal critter that builds these burrows or excavates burrows and piles of sediment up on these little sort of pyramid shaped tibies that could be shrimp or some other type of crustacean or it could be worms we're not entirely sure um, it's quite difficult to actually catch the animal in action uh, to try and match up the structure with the animal that built it um, 
we would need to sit and park Sebastian for quite some time and observe and wait for someone to go in or out. But seeing as how we can see quite a few shrimp around here at the moment, um, I guess it's a, it's a reasonable, a reasonable assumption to guess that they might be shrimp burrows. The image that you're seeing in the insert picture at the moment is a result of the multi-beam mapping that we've done over the last couple of days. Um, we've gone over this area using RV Falcor's multi-beam echo sounder system to build up this digital elevation model, um, sort of a, a digital picture of the topography of the seafloor. And um, that's what we are talking about when we say we've been mapping. So we've spent days and nights mapping around in this area. It was previously quite poorly mapped um, and RV Falcor does a really fantastic job um, with the multi-beam system. And so that red line gives you, that's our dive track for today. And as we pan out and pan around, you can see the geography, uh, geometry uh, of these submarine canyons as they cut into the edge of the continental shelf and the tops of the canyons um, tops of the canyons connect the deep sea floor with the shallow great barrier part of the great barrier reef the continental shelf and the particular canyon that we're in today is what we call uh, shelf incised and shelf connected so the top of the canyon cuts into the top of the edge of the continental shelf and it's an open channel it's not blocked at the top by a coral reef um, so that could explain why we've seen so much debris in the bottom of the canyon that should belong up in the shallows. It's like a transport pathway between the shallow to the deep. So we've seen quite a bit of woody debris, looked like mangrove wood, uh, sargassum and other algae that normally should be in the shallows. Um, so it's been transported and deposited here in the canyon and coconuts. Coconuts float so I guess they could come from anywhere. That's part of our scientific interest in studying these canyons is to see how the connections between the coast to the canyon to the deep sea floor and that helps us to understand sediment path transport pathways and of course canyons are a conduit in the opposite direction for the water mass being upwelled from the deep up through the canyon and onto the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon, carrying nutrients and um, in the water column. This part of the Great Barrier Reef is an area that we've been wanting to come to and survey for quite some time, um, at least a decade if not longer. And it's very difficult to get ship time on the right vessel that's going to the right place. Um, so we're very fortunate to be able to come here with RV Falcor and we'll just zoom in on what we're seeing here. is this could be a soft coral we're just going to pause here a moment and zoom in on that and get an ID on it give our colleagues on shore time to get a good look at it and let us know if it's something that we can just move on or if it's something that's of interest to them So we started this expedition in Brisbane a little over a week ago, a week and a half or so ago, and we've come all the way up the outside edge of the Great Barrier Reef to Cairns where we picked up some extra scientists, uh, Rob, Joan and Valerie joined us in Cairns and now we're on leg two of this expedition which is called Northern Depths of the Great Barrier Reef. Our social media hashtag is EdgeGBR. And you can follow along 
on the cruise webpage on the Schmidt Ocean Institute website, northern depths of the GBR. Will we put that a shrimp in there? Yeah. All right. And there we are, hashtag edge GBR. So we are on the outside edge of the Great Barrier Reef. So we were, we are seaward of um, the outer shelf barrier reefs or ribbon reefs. No. Okay. No, no one's getting excited. So we can... I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks, Cody. You're welcome. I'm trying to be enthusiastic here, guys. <clears throat> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, everything we see is interesting. And um, we could sit and look all day at everything that we come across. But we are limited by our dive time. And we need to keep in mind the targets that we have the we have scientific interest in everything but we've got certain targets that we need to prioritize for our observations and collections so we'll keep moving on looks like another one of those little red jellies just coming into the frame there we did collect one of these on a previous dive um, on the previous expedition out in the coral sea I think we were at just about exactly 1800 meters when we collected that one. So our general targets for the entire expedition, which will be, you know, pretty much every dive that we do. Um, so this, these decisions are made according to the collaborators that we're working with and the scientific questions that they have. And, and also um, the permits that we have for collecting because we are in, a, in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and World Heritage Area. So we'll be collecting um, corals, ha uh, hard corals, soft corals, and in particular black corals. Um, but not, not all types of corals. There are specific types that we're really um, looking for. Um, and sponges, especially carnivorous sponges. And we're interested in collecting sediment samples and hopefully some rock samples once we come across some rock outcrops. But our biology targets are hard corals, soft corals, black corals and sponges. And um, we are also permitted to collect other, a small number of other invertebrates. Um, so if there's anything that we come across that seems particularly unusual or um, if any of our onshore scientists suddenly get very excited and say can you collect one of those um, hopefully we have the capacity to do that um, the great barrier reef of course is huge as a as a marine park the area is something like 244,000 square kilometers and it's broken up into many different zones with different permitted activities and different regulations in, in each zone. So our permits are quite complicated. Um, there are certain activities we can do in some zones and not others. So each dive um, we need to consider where we are in location, what type of permit we have to cover collections in that particular zone. Um, the type of dive, so these canyon dives um, are different for example when we do what we lovingly call a Dougal dive. Um, so a Dougal dive is for our collaborator, Dougal Lindsay from Jamstech, who is interested in the water column, plankton and um, jellyfish. So we just, we do a midwater dive uh, for Dougal, um, where we just descend through the water column at a set um, speed and we image the plankton and the squishies, the jellies and siphonophores and those types of things and um, collect where we can, where it's appropriate, if it seems like it might be a new range extension for our region or indeed an undescribed species. But we're not doing a Dougal dive today. Um, we're really focusing today on those um, coral and sponge targets for the Queensland Museum, the Museum of Tropical Queensland, um, 
rocks yeah let's go check out the rocks <laughs> and um, the genome project that our colleague Jeremy Horowitz has been invited to collaborate on with the Smithsonian Institute um, so this is a wonderful opportunity This one? Um, not sure. Let's. We've got a lot of them. Let's get in close and have a look. So we're just discussing: are these an anemone or a sea squirt? I think Cody just said that because he wanted me to say anemone, 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 anemone. <laughs> they certainly look. Anemone-like. I'm just waiting for anyone to suddenly jump around and go, oh, it's a sponge, grab it, but I don't think it's a sponge. Anemone. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy says anemone. Thank you, Jeremy. Good job, Jeremy. Good job, Jeremy. <laughs> So now that we've come across some hard substrate, we'll spend a little bit of time here just looking around um, quite close in. We'll zoom right in. We're looking for these tiny little carnivorous sponges. I can get a little closer to that rock right there. Thank you. Right. I would love that. Ooh. And then I would love it if we got the drill out. I would too. Excellent. This is a Brisingid Brising sea star. Brisingid? Yes. Okay. And what family or group is Oh, uh, it's an asteroid. It it's a... Uh, it's a, an echinoderm. Yeah. Uh, Got a lot of arms. Yeah, they do. And people confuse them for, for brittle stars. Uh, but that, that pink is a real giveaway on them. And they're quite commonly found in these deeper waters. Uh, when they're all clustered together on the rock, they, they look really quite pretty. Nice rock, Marty. Yeah, it's rock and roll. We <laughs> so definitely rock because it's got this lovely dark ferromanganese oxide coating. So some of us in the room are excited by the rocks just for the sake of rocks, for the rock's sake, because uh, <laughs> we're marine <laughs> geologists. And mm. the biologists, ecologists, and taxonomists are excited by the rocks because they host um, epifaunal invertebrates that are attached to the rocks. Well, actually, is it rock or is it just a bit of like soft strata really that really slid soft. down slow? It's really, really soft. Mm -hmm. We just dug into it. Oh, you did? I thought it was rock. Okay. But we'll try it again. So the alternative hypothesis, if it's not rock, is that these are lumps of yeah. sort of cohesive solidified mud blocks yeah, yeah. that come down from the side of the canyon wall. That's right. They, they seem to have a bit, quite a bit of layering. And if you have a look at this sort of the mound-like structure, it could just be some debris, a very large piece of debris that slid down slope, uh, stabilised, and you get ferromanganese oxide on the outside. Um, you know, if it, essentially it, it becomes hard, hard enough substrate that animals can attach to. Call out to Jodie Webster, who's one of our principal investigators. Jodie's at University of Sydney and uh, Unfortunately, he's, he's stuck in Sydney while we're out here on the Falcor, but uh, it's great to have Jody joining us through, through Facebook while we're diving. Just 
studying our position here. Um, yeah, so we had a question, how cold is it? Well, it's, it really is cold. It's 2.6 degrees Celsius here uh, right now. We're at 1769 meters, so 1.7 kilometers down, nearly two kilometers deep uh, right here in the uh, in this canyon. Uh, very cold, 2.6 degrees C. Uh, so this would be Antarctic intermediate water. It's, it's a water mass that's that's uh, generated south of of Australia in the Southern Ocean, and it uh, it follows the topography of these deep. Uh, valleys and canyons. You can see these markings. Um, so I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at that um, face that's towards us at the moment, just below the pink um, brittle star. Or sorry, rock. what? It's a those, sea star. Yeah. yeah. So those it's markings, those markings on the rock. Yeah, we're just going to touch this to see how soft it is. But what's this over here on the left here, Marty? This um, um, translucent. Uh, yeah, we just saw a few of those as we just came into view here. Uh, so this, rather yeah, than... yeah. Okay. Um, Is it? it? Oh, here we go. Ah, uh, yes. Here we go. Okay. It's soft. All right. So. So not... We think this is probably just a very large piece of uh, the side wall that's broken off and collapsed. And so we're looking at a large block, but it's a debris block that slid down from above, and it's. Uh, it, it, its components are just the soft sediment. It's cohesive, um, and uh, you know it stayed intact as it slid down slope. Could it be a corallomorph? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, that one. Is that they the same thing? So we saw tunic. Uh, sorry, anemones earlier. Wow. Um, that is really odd looking. Yeah, quite odd. So there's an enemy off to the left. But yep. These what is had that? their tentacles out. Prior, prior. Could it be? A, could it be a sea cucumber? With it? Are we looking at a mouth? I have no idea what that is. So it certainly had tentacles that were out um, yeah. earlier before we, we got in this close. Like ne near this, di around this disc? Yeah, they're all kind of um, retracted in yeah. at the moment, but they were out and okay. waving around. Well, I guess I'm leaning towards a sea cucumber of some kind, a holotherian. Ooh, something's coming out. Okay, this is kind of looking more sea cucumber-like now. This being the the tentacles 